Hi, I'm Peter Birch, and in this week's show, we've traveled all the way to BHB Reptiles here in Detroit in the USA to check out some awesome animals and learn a bit more about selective breeding. Welcome to Criticam. I've been here at BHP quite a few times over the last few years and I can tell you what, as an Australian, I continually get blown away by the different colours and patterns through all these wonderful animals. And I tell you what, the benefits of selective breeding are absolutely amazing, just like this albino brook snake. I mean, how could you not fall in love with something just like this? Man, these things are spectacular animals. This week's question of the week. How many colubrids does Australia have? 15, 6 or 8? Please leave a comment below. Brian, I mean, looking around in your facility, you have so many colubrids. Now in Australia, we don't have that variety just like you guys. And I mean, the colours and the patterns are absolutely spectacular. Can you show us a bit about what you guys are achieving through line breeding? Oh, absolutely. You know, the Nelson's milk snake is probably a great example of uh, the polygenics that's going on. Now, this just happens to be you know, a beautiful animal in its own right. Oh, it's yeah. a normal. This is what you would find in the wild right here, um, a Nelson's milk snake. So you've got the tri-colors with the triads, black, yellow, white pretty simplistic, right? Yep. Um, again, back 20 years ago, this was what we were breeding, stuff like this. And then probably right around 20 years ago, the first real mutation of this particular species cropped up. And it was actually a guy named Doug Moody that spontaneously produced him from some founder stock animals. Wow. And this kind of, this is just an albino, Yep. Nelson's milk snake, kind of like a candy cane. And this kind of brings up something when you're, you're outbreeding too much, sometimes you can't concentrate the action albinism. Mm -hmm. So what happened was Doug Moody bred two normal looking animals that were related that just happened to both be het for albino unknowingly. Now if he would have wow. never crossed those two animals together, they would have never produced albino. So wow. sometimes line breeding and breeding actual relatives together, as long as it doesn't become too in-depth in breeding where you start getting other issues, okay. can actually have spectacular animals like this albino Nelson's. But since there's been even more traits that people have been starting to breed for, like take for example what they call the bullseye albinos wow. right here. And again, a normal Nelson's milk snake is going to have the triads, the bands. These guys literally just have the bull's eyes, you yeah, know, they definitely. have the little red things. And this is a polygenic trait. So basically what was happening was we were taking animals that had the least amount of banding, starting, you can see on this animal right here where there's just a little bit, doesn't quite go around, you start breeding those, you line breed that to another one that has it, and eventually you get the bullseye animals. So again, it's what they would call polygenic or line bred. Yeah, and I know definitely. that you're doing a lot of that with your anchoracea. Oh, yeah. And, and I, I, th I really think most Australians really don't understand the benefits of line breeding at the moment. You know, we're working with certain genes and sometimes no genes at all, just the actual benefits from line breeding itself. As long as you're not getting into, you know, deformities within yeah. the, the bloodline, line breeding cannot be a problem. And I know there was many studies done that says that until you get about four to five generations of inbreeding in, you really aren't changing any of the chromosomes whatsoever okay. that are going to cause mutations or, awesome. or deformities or, or the, the negatives. Uh, this is another an example of a polygenic trait here, which is line bred, which is we're just trying to breed away the bands. Yep. Instead of making them bullseye, we're just trying to get rid of them all together and yeah. you come up with a completely patternless one. I mean, that's pretty spectacular. Yeah, and I mean, we still have a little bit of pattern here, but in another two, three generations, this should be a solid red snake. And you can get it in the normal wild type with the black eyes, a little black on the head, or we can get the albino version like wow. this. And then there's one step further that's even kind of more interesting. And I don't know if you guys in Australia have really come across this particular type of trait whatsoever, but this is what they call an allelic trait, okay? okay? So this is a, a T-positive albino, so it still has a tyrosine, mm -hmm. which is a type of melanin, but it's not, uh, it's, it's not the, the, the full albino, just like your children's pythons, yep. right? But what's interesting with this guy is, believe it or not, it basically shares the same protein on an allele as albinism, wow. okay? okay? So that, you don't breed this to get heterozygous wild types and then produce this. You actually breed this to a normal albino, the red 
yellow, and white animals, and half the babies right off the rip wow. come out T positive. So again, because they share the same trait, basically they're het for one another more or less. But you'll never actually produce a T positive from a T negative. You need one of each in order to produce that trait. Wow, that's pretty spectacular. I mean, the colors and the patterns, like you said, Man, genes help, but line breeding also is beneficial as well. Absolutely. We wouldn't have known if we didn't breed these things together if they come out. So the genetics in Clubrids are absolutely amazing, but I actually have to get back into the Python okay. room. There's some insane stuff in there if you want to oh, talk awesome. more genetics. So hit me up as soon as you can. Oh, all right? definitely. We sure will. Meanwhile, we'll have a look around and check out some more wonderful colored Colubrids. These things are just spectacular. When you're looking around, you cannot help to be amazed, not only by the colors and patterns, but man, even by something like this. This is a Vietnamese rhino rat snake. Oh, I tell you what, that appendage on the end of its face, it's a little bit strange. They're typically a very arboreal species, and you can see with that nice long tail, it's really good to hang on to stuff. Man, this thing, bright green. Like I said, that thing on its nose, that's unique. Next, we've got the Texas rat snake. I mean, these animals are a very large, impressive animal in itself. But imagine what these colors would look like once we strip back the actual scales. Well, believe it or not, there's a genetic trait, a straight recessive genetic trait, the scaleless trait that strips away those scales, enhancing those background colors. And man, you cannot help but to be impressed with these colors that lay below the scales. Look at this little beauty here. Another simple recessive trait, and you gotta fall in love with this beautiful white snake, is the leucistic Texas rat. I mean, compared to the colors of the other guys, oh, how could you not love this beautiful white snake? Quite an impressive sized animal. It's got a good nature too. One of the other amazing animals I found here, the hognose snakes. Now these guys again, are a colubrid, and believe it or not, some people do have an allergic reaction to the advanced saliva. It's almost like a mild venom. But man, these things are quite unique and interesting looking animals. I mean, look at the face on that guy. It's built like a shovel. <laughs> man, these things are cool. Now we're gonna have a look at some different colors. This is what they're calling a toffee. Now you gotta admit that color is pretty impressive and you can see where the names come from. It's got that wonderful toffee looking color. Now this is a straight recessive trait, making it a lot easier to work with and manipulate. Now, other color forms they're working with, and this guy here is a little bit cranky. It's this, that is an exanthic. Man, the exanthic actually strips away the reds and the yellows, leaving almost a black and white animal. That thing is very impressive and a little bit cranky too. There again, that's another straight recessive trait. Another recessive trait they're working with is the albino gene. And we've got one of those little fellas here to have a look at as well. Here he is here. You've got to admit, in the albino form, those colors and those patterns just pop. Well, that's enough of the colubrid. So now we're into the python room. We're going to find Brian and learn a little bit more about multi-gene animals. Let's go. Hey Brian, I've been looking around and man, this is one spectacular animal. Can you tell me what's in this animal? Well, you've got good taste. This is actually a banana chocolate spinner. So it basically has banana, spider, right. pinstripe, and chocolate in it. So it's a four bang animal and it's really beautiful. But I want to kind of break it down for you so you understand each individual gene. We started with a chocolate ball python, which okay. doesn't look much different than a normal ball python, but it has much more chocolate to it. This happens to be a co-dominant mutation. Then there's also a pinstripe ball python, which is a dominant mutation, which acts the same way, but doesn't have a super form. We also have a spider in it, which is a spider is what causes the spinner. Again, a dominant mutation that doesn't have a super form. And then we also have a banana gene, which right now is being term codominant. We think there might be a super, but we're not 100% sure. So those are the four individual genes that we have going on within it. Now, when we started combining them, we start looking at things like, this is the chocolate 
and the pinstripe together. Okay. So this is a chocolate pinstripe, which is again, a dominant and a co-dominant animal, okay. Yep. okay? And then when you add the banana gene in, this would happen to be a banana pinstripe. So you can see that really spectacular Whoa. yellows and, and purples coming through. And this would be the exact same way when you're adding the spider into it. So this is the spider version of banana. So a banana okay. spider. So you start to see the layering starting to happen. This is the last double mutation here. This would be a chocolate banana, which just has all those crazy purples in it. Now, when you start layering these guys, this would happen to be a chocolate pinstripe banana. And then lastly, we would put the spider gene in, which is this gene, into this animal, and we'd ultimately get the chocolate spinner. Wow, banana. I mean, that is one magnificent animal. <laughs> and to have so many genes in different colors working in the background to create this, I mean, this is a masterpiece. It really is. It takes a lot of years and a lot of luck to land those types of odds. Man. This week's question of the week. How many colubrids does Australia have? If you guessed B, six, with four species and two subspecies, you're correct. Good job. I hope you enjoyed today's show about selective breeding. And as you can see, the benefits speak for themselves. I tell you what, I've learned something today. I hope you have too. Please leave a comment below, hit me up on Facebook and Twitter. Until next time, you've been watching Critter Cam.